Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Eunan Friel, and I'd like to welcome you to RCSI's National Healthcare Outcomes Conference. It's our first virtual one, so fingers crossed the technology works well for us. I guess over the past year, Ireland's health services and indeed those of every country around the world has had to deal with an unprecedented global threat that has pushed the capacity of our health capacity to, to breaking point. Uh, the, the immediate and necessary response has obviously been to prioritize the bulk of health service capacity to meet the uh, acuity of the COVID-19 challenge. Um, it's, it's strange, but more or less this time last year when we were beginning to plan for this event, uh, we had hoped to be looking at, at COVID-19 and, and the rear view mirror, <clears throat> excuse me, but at a time nonetheless when uh, we're by no means out of the woods, but we can certainly see some, some light at the end of the tunnel, the title of today's conference, Sustaining Healthcare in a COVID World, is I think particularly timely. So how can we understand the impact of COVID-19 on the totality of our health service? And more importantly, perhaps, what have we learned that we can take forward uh, as we plan a more sustainable healthcare delivery and patient outcomes for, for the future? So I'm sure I speak for all of you when uh, I say I'm very much looking forward to the discussion this afternoon. So at the outset, I just want to thank sincerely all of our speakers for generously giving up their time uh, this afternoon to be with us. And I want too to acknowledge the support from our sponsor, uh, Novartis Ireland, uh, for their support and input to, to the programme this year and other years. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, a number of, of opening remarks, the first of whom is from what I'd imagine is a very busy Minister for Health, Mr. Stephen Donnelly. I'm really pleased to be able to join you all this afternoon to open this conference. I'd like to thank the RCSI for their kind invitation, which allows me to update you on our plans to safely resume our healthcare services. There has been, and of course always will be, an intense focus on healthcare. This is not surprising. All of us depend on healthcare at various times in our lives. However, that focus intensified globally last year. Healthcare systems have been and continue to be tested right throughout this pandemic. I'd like to acknowledge just how resilient and adaptable our healthcare professionals have been throughout the pandemic and particularly during the difficult surge periods. We owe them a huge debt of gratitude. The event today comes at an opportune juncture in our journey. We as a nation can begin to hope and as we see the emerging benefits associated with the rollout of the COVID-19 vaccination program, that hope can grow. We see those benefits while at the same time we're grappling with the ongoing and persistent impact the pandemic has had on the delivery of health services across Ireland. The pandemic led to unprecedented interruption to normal healthcare activity, both in community and in acute settings. While many vital services were maintained or restructured to respond more appropriately to the COVID-19 related risks, other services were suspended or delivered on a reduced basis. In acute settings, many health services deemed elective or non-urgent were suspended. The provision of other health services, particularly in the community setting, were also significantly affected by the redeployment of healthcare staff we also notice a reduction in the utilisation of services caused by a reluctance of people to attend appointments due to a fear of being infected. For example, there was a noteworthy decrease in attendances at GPs. The result of all this manifests as an increase in the number of patients on waiting lists, both since the pandemic, since the beginning of the third wave and since the outset of the pandemic generally. I recognise the impact of increased waiting times and the possible health implications for people who may present later with health conditions. I think it's important to state, however, that many vital and critical services continued through all stages of the pandemic. 
for example, from the outset of the, the pandemic, the government has placed an emphasis on the continuation of cancer services. Urgent and time-sensitive treatments are being prioritised based, of course, on clinical considerations. Significant steps have been taken within the HSE to restore services and to operate COVID care and non-COVID care side by side in a safe way, a difficult undertaking. To assist with this, I was very pleased to be in a position to increase the annual budget for the HSC to 20.6 billion euro this year. This is three and a half billion more than last year's allocation. This funding will enhance our services, including community services, services to older people, disability services, and mental health services. In our acute services, this funding looks to provide 1,146 additional acute beds, 135 additional subacute beds, 66 additional critical care beds to bring the total number of adult critical care beds to 321 by the end of this year, and 1,250 community beds. It will also enhance the delivery of scheduled care services, mitigating as far as possible the impact of COVID-19 through the provision of 98,000 additional outpatient assessments and 36,500 additional inpatient or uh, day case procedures. The allocation will also provide for the expansion of our workforce by 16,000 compared to the employment levels in December of 2019. This includes additional medical staff, nurses and midwives, and other health and social care professionals. There is no question that there are significant challenges ahead of us in dealing with the impacts of COVID-19. However, there are great opportunities too. COVID-19 has demonstrated just how agile and flexible our healthcare services can be in difficult times. Practitioners and staff from across the various health sectors, both public and private, worked collaboratively with the common aim of protecting the public. Several impressive innovations have taken place during this time. Many of those innovations serve to progress the reform of our healthcare service as set out in the Slauncher Care Vision. The challenge for us now is to build positively on the collaborations and the innovations to tackle the impact of COVID-19 while at the same time reforming our health service for everyone in the country. Finally, I'd like to note the distinguished lineup of speakers for today's event, and I have no doubt it will be both interesting and enlightening. I note that Dr. Nick Klesinga from the OECD will also be pre presenting. We've been very fortunate in having Nick and his team from the University of Amsterdam working with us on the development of a health system performance assessment framework. We're in the process of moving from development to implementation and I have no doubt this framework will be a very effective tool to measure health outcomes in Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for those uh, optimistic comments in relation to future capacity. Uh, I'd now like to invite our president of RCSI, Professor Ronan O'Connell, to make some remarks. Ronan. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as president of RCSI, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the annual National Healthcare Outcomes Conference organized by the RCSI Healthcare Research Outcomes Center. Uh, it is no surprise that the theme of today's conference reflects the greatest healthcare challenge of a generation, arguably of the last hundred years. I'm very grateful to Minister Donnelly for his introductory remarks and for his acknowledgement of the extraordinary resilience of our healthcare workforce in dealing with the challenges that they faced. To this, I would personally add tribute to the enormous contributions of our public health service and indeed the HSE leadership in guiding the nation through this most difficult period. As we begin to emerge from the crisis, there is much to reflect on. In risk management terms, we have had really a very near miss from the hospital network being overwhelmed. Not that nearly 5,000 deaths from COVID could in any way be considered a near miss. However, the system did not implode and mortality rates in Ireland are less than half those in the UK against whose NHS the HSE is constantly benchmarked. As a society, our response to COVID has been in the main remarkable. 
but the pandemic has laid bare many organizational and infrastructural deficits in our healthcare system. While these shortcomings have been known about for years, the need to expand critical care and to increase diagnostic and treatment capacity in our hospitals while simultaneously focusing on community care must be leveraged and the opportunities grasped. Indeed, many such opportunities have presented themselves as system innovations born out of the necessity of this pandemic. To quote Lenin, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happen. That time is upon us in Irish healthcare. I look forward to hearing of the lessons learned and the plans for recalibrating the healthcare system from our very learned faculty and also to the lively debate that I'm sure will be engendered and chaired by Audrey Carvel. Uh, my thanks to all our speakers and to Novartis for their support and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, I'd finally now like to ask the country president for Novartis Ireland, Dr. Audrey Derveloy, to say a few words. Good afternoon, everyone. So Novartis are very prone to again be partnering with uh, SCSI to support the creation of this important conference. At the inaugural event back in 2019, we recognized the necessity for providing a platform to progress the national conversation around health outcomes in Ireland. This needs has become even more critical now as we all navigate our way into the post-COVID environment. I would like uh, to pay particular thanks to both Union Field and Jan Zorensen of the RCSI who have made you know, this conference a reality. I'm really looking forward to listening with interest to the presentations because the caliber of speakers is very impressive. So on behalf of Novartis Island, big thank you. Thank you, Dr. Derveloy. Thank you indeed. Um, and now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Audrey Carvel, broadcaster and journalist, to chair the main session for this afternoon. Uh, over to you, Audrey. Yunan, thank you so much indeed. Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here. And I'm delighted to be part of this conference and chairing it this afternoon. It's such a vitally important topic, the pressures on our healthcare system, how it has radically changed over the past year and what needs to change as we move out of this pandemic. They are all such vitally important discussions which affect us all. We have a highly expert group of people to talk to you this afternoon. They will each speak for around 15 minutes and then you will get an opportunity to submit your questions to them. So please use that Q&A button on your screen, submit your questions and indicate if you can who you wish to answer them. So let me introduce our first speaker. Kenneth Mealy is a consultant general surgeon based in Wexford General Hospital and St. Vincent's University Hospital in Dublin. He was instrumental in establishing the National Office of Clinical Audit and is currently the chair of its board. He has had a long interest in performance management and quality improvement in surgery, and he has published widely on these and other surgical topics. He is the current joint lead of the National Clinical Programme in Surgery. Kenneth. Audrey, thank you very much. Um, and while I just share my slides, hopefully you can see those. Um, Now, Audrey, thank you very much. Uh, I've been asked to address the impact of COVID-19 on healthcare delivery in Ireland. And I think um, we're all aware of the, of the profound impact COVID-19 has had on, in, on healthcare in Ireland. It's a broad subject, and I don't intend to address primary or community care, because clearly this is a big issue. Uh, I feel competent to talk about the impact of COVID uh, on secondary or tertiary care, that is hospital uh, services. Uh, this afternoon, I want to talk a little bit about waiting list data. I'll talk about hospital discharges in terms of scheduled care and emergency or acute care 
And I'll finish off by talking a little bit about data management and quality assurance uh, that comes from the Office of the National Office of Clinical Audit. The data I'll refer to is our hype data uh, as uh, we access through the NICWIS. Uh, uh, portal, NICWIS is the National Quality Assurance uh, and Improvement System portal, which allows us interrogate hype data, uh, and with, it also allows us use hype data for the no NOCA audits. Uh, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about our waiting lists. Uh, as expected this year, uh, outpatient waiting lists have increased by a relatively modest percent, 12% over the last uh, year during this COVID period. Of, what is of more importance, however, has been the long-term waiters, that these have increased by a greater amount. And we think this is because that fewer people have been actually put on waiting this because of lack of access to GPs uh, who, who, who refer patients. And the, the same scenario arises when we look at inpatient and day case waiters. Uh, there has been an increase over the year, year on year, but a far greater increase has occurred in relation to long-term waiters. These are patients who've been on the waiting list for quite some time. I have an interest in surgery, and you can see that surgical patients make up over 50% of the outpatient waiters and anything between 50 and 80% of those waiting for procedures in hospitals. And, and this, of course, causes huge issues in relation to those slaunch care aspirations of seeing and treating patients within 10 and 12 weeks, respectively. Uh, if we look at hospital discharges, the data I'm going to show you is trend data over uh, looking at discharges over the last three years. And you can see that over the last calendar year, this is 2019 to 2020, there's been an 18% decrease in total discharges. Uh, the different color codes refer to how patients are admitted or discharged, whether they're be, they are emergency day, day cases, emergency stay patients, uh, elective day patients or elective stay patients. And you can see that there's been a significant decrease over the last year. Uh, for scheduled care or elective patients, the increase has been greater at 20%. And of particular interest, as I say to myself, is that uh, combined surgical uh, patients have a 30% decrease in, in discharges from hospitals over the last calendar year. I guess we're all concerned about particularly vulnerable patients and cancer fits into this category. Cancer patients have had a decrease also, a total decrease in approximately 15% of discharges uh, over the calendar years 2019 to 2020. Many of these patients are day cases for relatively minor diagnostic procedures, and you cannot see it in this chart, but even stay patients, there has been some decreases. And if we look at some of those cancers, if you look at colorectal cancer or breast cancer, as I have shown here, um, elective surgery for colorectal cancer has, has decreased by uh, over 20%. Emergencies to a lesser extent, and I'll come back to emergency care later. In, in breast cancer, we do not have emergency surgery, but elective day cases, which make up a lot of our diagnostic uh, uh, processes, these have decreased, uh, and to a lesser ex extent, elective surgery by a sizable number, as you can see, 38%. And of course, this does have impacts for patients, and I draw your attention to this modelling study produced by Morange and colleagues in Lancet Oncology last June, July, uh, 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 from the UK, looking that if, uh, at uh, modeling patients, if you take them from uh, early diagnoses, those are patients who perhaps are diagnosed in screening uh, rounds and screening programs. Uh, and if you uh, look at their outcomes uh, for those patients, if they were transferred to higher risk groups, such as those who present with sy symptomatic disease, there are a very, uh, there is a significant years of life loss for all of the major cancers, patients with esophageal cancer, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, uh, and lung cancer. So clearly to a certain cohort of cancer patients, this does have implications for them and their families. If we look at non-cancer uh, uh, or benign conditions, I've 
chosen three operations which would be familiar with uh, many uh, lay people, uh, hip arthroplasty, hernia repair, and uh, surgery for gallstone disease. You can see year on year, uh, 2020, there's been approximately 30% reduction in these operations having taken place in the Irish public health system uh, last year in comparison to previous years. And I do stress this is the public system. We do not have data as to what happened in the private sector in this country. And of course, this has implications for waiting lists and the media attention and the political fallout uh, from uh, these longer waiting lists. I want to spend a little time talking about emergency surgical admissions. Uh, this slide shows uh, all the medical and surgical specialties and the color bars within the column show the decrease in uh, discharges uh, in these specialties in 2020 in comparison to 2019. And you can see that in general, there's approximately 15% decrease in emergency discharges uh, over the last year. And the minister alluded to, to this in his address. For surgery, it's slightly greater at 16.5%. And it begs the question as to why this has happened. If you look at all of surgery, as I say, a 16% reduction, the red bar looks at stay patients, uh, the, the green ones are day case uh, admissions and discharges, there aren't as many of these. And if you look at a major surgical uh, specialty, such as colorectal surgeon, surgery, even in this specialty, there's been a 12% reduction. And it begs the question, as I say, as to why this would happen. If we turn our attention to some of the medical subspecialties, uh, and this is for respiratory disease, I've, I've picked out respiratory codes because we know that in Ireland, we admit more patients with respiratory conditions than most other comparable OECD European countries. And you can see that uh, uh, last year, we did not have this uh, winter bulge that you see in, in previous years. Again, these are three year uh, trend diagrams. And the colour codes, just to refer to how these patients are admitted, whether they come to a medical admissions units or whether they're directly admitted to wards. And you can see that uh, 2019 to 2020, 22% reduction uh, in these patients. And that amounts to a serious number of bed days saved. And in fact, would amount to about 200 beds uh, being added to the system. And just because one might say, well, this is related to the lack of influenza perhaps uh, in, in the last year, let's pick out a few respiratory codes that aren't related to influenza necessarily, COPD or bronchiectasis or asthma. And you can see again, we do not have the winter surge last year, 30, 26% reduction in these specialties. And again, significant bed savings. And it does beg the question as to what is going on here. Looking nationally at a 15% reduction in emergency admissions, uh, nationally, we're talking about nearly 400,000 bed days saved, which is equivalent to adding another 1,000 beds to the system. And the implications for this, I think, is that admission avoidance can happen, and care in the community has to be a realistic proposition, uh, which I, I know fits in with Slonchigare uh, projections, and hopefully perhaps we'll hear more about that later on in some of the other talks. But it does imply a certain degree of clinical discretion as to how and why patients present to EDs and how and why they are admitted. And I think we do all understand that there is variation, huge variation, which is inexplicable across the system. And a lot of this is perhaps related to senior decision makers. And also we know there is an issue in relation to gaming the system, clinicians bypassing standard admission processes because of need to access diagnostics and procedures. I'd like to end up by talking a little bit about quality assurance. And this is data produced by uh, the National Office of Clinical Audit. This complex looking staff, uh, graph looks at the ICU bed information system and I must um, commend the acute division of the HSE who, which supported the rollout of this live um, information dashboard which has uh, really helped uh, intensive care unit bed usage during the COVID period. The, the lower blue line you can see looks at COVID uh, confirmed patients in our ICUs and the upper line uh, in purple indicates the number of open beds in ICUs. And clearly you can see that with the different surges, these matched, and as alluded to, uh, 
uh, by the president of RCSI and the minister, we have managed to increase ICU capacity. And one of the huge benefits of this was the ability to transfer patients from hospital to hospital. And this was particularly important for some of the hospital, smaller hospitals that did not have uh, huge numbers of ICU beds. We've also been able to map many of the COVID patients through the NOCA audit process. And while we have not looked at this in great detail, I think we will find when we model this uh, in the future that we have compared favorably with outcomes for COVID patients in other hospitals. I want to just talk briefly about two of the NOCA audits. The first is the hip fracture patients. And we can, we can demonstrate that we have maintained high quality care and improved it in some aspects with some of these audits. There are seven quality indicators of good outcome for hip fractures. The first one being access to an orthopedic ward in four hours. And you can see this actually increased uh, during the COVID period. Two did not change. This was access to theater for operation within the first 48 hours. And then good nursing care as demonstrated by an absence of, of pressure sores. These have all remained stable. So I think this is an area where we can uh, be confident that the health service have provided good quality care. And it's um, certainly an indication uh, of uh, the great um, uh, determination of our nursing colleagues to provide good quality care. We have fallen down, however, in an aspect of multidisciplinary care, multidisciplinary meetings regarding these patients um, have become less frequent. And I think this is probably related to uh, workforce issues, challenges to that in terms of trying to maintain COVID and non-COVID uh, workforce streams on the medical side of things. As a consequence, however, of uh, hip fracture management, interestingly, has been a decrease in length of stay of 4.5 days. And while we haven't looked at that in detail, it may be something simple, such as less frail and elderly patients who are cocooning, not falling and breaking their hips. Uh, it does imply, however, good, good progress through patient flow pathways in our hospitals. And then just briefly to look at our stroke report, uh, our first stroke report last year, looking at one of the major determinants of outcome is rapid access to medical teams and imaging. And you can see that this has increased in the COVID period. So again, it, an indication that for various serious underlying conditions, we have maintained good quality care in our health service despite COVID. But again, in this audit also, we can see that there has been a decrease in multidisciplinary team engagement with stroke patients. And again, I think it, it, it reflects on challenges to um, manpower issues or workforce issues within the health service. Two minutes so, left, Kenneth. Okay, so just to finish off, the implications of all this is scheduled care will always be compromised when hospitals are under pressure. We see this every winter, but this is more so during COVID. And clearly this has major implications for other serious non-COVID indications, as I've indicated for benign disease, but particularly cancer conditions. And a reduction in emergency care, however, does warrant a serious discussion because this perhaps uh, should contribute to uh, our understanding of new ways of working, understanding that care can be provided in the community uh, and improving patient flow when we have less congestion in our hospitals. Clearly, there are issues in relation to addressing our waiting list and diagnostics. And I haven't really addressed, but I alluded to uh, understanding the medical and medical legal implications of delayed diagnoses. So the last slide through the NOCA office, I would also like to commend our colleagues, both medics, medic, medical nursing and administrative staff to the health service who've contributed so much during this pandemic. And I think this is an appropriate uh, quote to finish on. Uh, from Tim Harford uh, last week in, in, in Financial Times. What we now need are outcome pessimists who are control optimists, people who believe that the post-COVID world can be better, but only if we decide to make it so. And I think we need this carry, in, carry this into planning for the future, understanding the lessons that we've seen from COVID. Thank you very much. Kenneth, thank you so much. Really, really interesting data. Thank you so much indeed for that presentation. Our next speaker this afternoon is Dr. Sarah Burke, Research Assistant Professor of Health Policy in the Centre for Health Policy and Management at Trinity College Dublin. She is currently researching the potential of the Irish COVID-19 health system's responses to inform the implementation of Slauncher Care. She also leads the Irish teams reporting to the World Health Organization, the European Commission and the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Sarah. 
Good afternoon, Audrey, and thank you to uh, RCSI and particularly uh, Jan Sorensen and Ewan Friel for inviting me to speak here today. I'm going to hopefully share my screen and Audrey, you might tell me if that's not working, but I think it should be working now. No. Not just fully yet, Sarah. Okay. So. Bear with me. Uh, hmm. Okay, maybe I'll stop and start again. How about okay. that? Okay. Uh, it worked in our. <laughs> it did in our rehearsal. <laughs> it always does. Ah, uh, okay. But take your time. It's fine. Um, okay, now. Oh, deep breaths. Okay, try again. No, it's not happening, is it? Yeah, I can see it. We can, can see it now. now. Yeah. yeah. Just... Ah, oh, fantastic. Okay. And if you just hit slides, you'll press it. Yeah. Okay. Apologies. Go. <laughs> I will. Uh, so for the next 15 minutes, I am going to uh, hopefully get you thinking about and trigger a discussion about whether, if and how COVID-19 provides a window of opportunity for slauncher care. Uh, and I'm going to do this in two ways. I'm going to briefly uh, tell you about the research that I'm engaged in and a component of that research, which provides a high level policy analysis on the impact of COVID-19 on the implementation of slauncher care. And just to tell you the backstory in our sort of pre-COVID world, this was a research project foundations funded by the Health Research Board under its applied partnership scheme. And Laura McGahey as executive director of slauncher care is the lead knowledge user on the project. And on these research projects, the core funding is from the HRB, but uh, the partners also contribute to that funding. So both the Slauncher Care Implementation Office in the Department of Health and the HSE are contributing to funding the project. And the aim of the project pre-COVID was to generate research and evidence which would inform the design and implementation of the regions. And the regional integrated care areas were a component of the implementation of Slauncher Care, which is to provide sub-national structures to fund and deliver integrated care. And we were up and running for about six months doing co-design, co-production, starting on some of our rapid reviews and primary areas of research. So we were about six months into the project when COVID arrived. And when COVID arrived, the work that was progressing on the regions, and this was largely being progressed by a senior team in the Department of Health and the HSE. And as my role as a researcher, I was a participant observer in these team meetings. And um, all that work was put on hold as pretty much every senior and every throughout the system, health system person was put to work in response to the COVID crisis. And I was in discussions with Laura McGahey as to if and how we could progress this research during COVID, but also was there something more useful we could do to contribute to the COVID response. And Professor O'Connell quoted Lennon uh, in his opening remarks, and he said how there were weeks when decades happen. And I think he's absolutely right. And I think those weeks were occurring actually exactly around this time last year, in March and April and May, when there was all these innovative and agile responses in the system, but also very interesting responses in the system that really aligned with the slauncher care vision and aims. So the fact that all the COVID responses are universal and free at the point of delivery, that everybody, and we still do, has access to a free telephone triage call with the GP if we have COVID symptoms. Uh, the fact that prescribing, e-prescribing, which had been promised for decades, went live universally within the first five and seven days of COVID-19. So all these responses happening very quickly. And simultaneously, the European Commission and WHO Europe were putting together this um, what they call COVID-19 health system response monitor, which was gathering the health system responses 
across um, scores actually of European countries way beyond the European Union to learn from this natural experiment of how health systems were responding. And we thought this was an opportunity to feed Ireland's response into a European and global context, but also to learn what was happening internationally. And so with lots of negotiation with our partners, with the funders, the HRB, the HSE and the Department of Health, it was agreed to shift the focus from the regions to try and harness if and what learnings could become, could we take from the COVID response to inform Slauncher Care's implementation? And while the focus of the research changed, the team very much remained the same. And here are just mugshots of most of the people who've been involved are currently involved. So very senior personnel in the Department of Health and the HSE there to the left who were co-applicants, also Joseph Figueres from the European Observatory, Laura McGahey, the lead knowledge user, uh, colleagues who are co-applicants, researchers and collaborators from the Centre for Health Policy, and then others in the HSE and Slaunch Care Implementation Office. And while there's only two of us actually funded out of this project, over 20 people involved in different ways, and indeed others too increasingly involved in this research. So very much a collaborative partnership effort. And what we've spent a lot of the last year doing is scoping and assessing over 70 health system responses to COVID-19 and trying to narrow them down to which of these are scalable and sustainable to contribute towards Slauncher Care's implementation. And we've whittled them down to about 10 clusters. And actually, there was quite a lot of uh, synergy between the areas we've narrowed them down to and some of what Ken was just presenting to you there. So I look forward to further conversations with you, Ken, about this. And the plan is when we have some data and a narrative around these 10 clusters to do three deep dive case studies. But the living part of the project is that we're feeding it continuously into senior personnel in the HSE in the Department of Health so that it's a living live project, constantly informing decisions made. And a part of that project is documenting the Slaunter Care implementation process. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about for the next nine minutes. And in, I've been researching of and for policy uh, for the last, for over 20 years. And one of the, and we use frameworks to help us analyze and understand what is happening. And one of the frameworks I like to use, I've used a lot of is John Kingdon, an American political scientist whose work showed us that when the problem policy and political streams come together, they can open this window of opportunity that creates a moment for change and significant reform. Now that window can close again, but when it's open is a particularly interesting and useful time. And this work, it's quite old, his work is from the 80s and the 90s and has gained new, new life recently with a Canadian uh, political scientist and public policy academic called Michael Howlett. And he's added in these extra streams of the process stream and the program stream, which help us understand more of the complexity of implementing major system reform. And I'll draw on these lightly um, in my following analysis. Students of mine, and I know there's a few or ex-students of mine who are listening today, will know my uh, attachment to policy timelines. Because I think often if you just describe, just put in a timeline, it gives you a narrative of what has happened and often what hasn't happened uh, to make a policy happen. And if we look at the first two years of Flaunche Care, sort of key moments were the publication of the Oireachtas report in uh, 2017, and then the publication of the Slauncher Care Implementation Strategy in August 18. And uh, you will notice it took quite a while for it to go from an Oireachtas report into an official government implementation strategy. Uh, the next part of the timeline is focused on this 2019, sort of pre-COVID. And what you see here are key documents that came out of Slauncher Care the second one there being the 2019 Slaunter Care Action Plan, which actually was much closer to the original Oxus report to the implementation strategy published uh, August in the previous year, but also reports that had been commissioned to progress aspects of Slaunter Care 
perhaps some more controversial aspects of social care, like the removal of private practice, so the de Butler report and the announcement of a public only contract in September of that year, the announcement of the regional health areas, long needed agreement of a GP contract and the establishment of a HSE board. But if we take a step back and use our policy analysis lens to help us understand what was going on here, the literature is very clear in the policy world that if you have a strong consensus on the problem and a consensus on the policy solution, you're, we're much more likely to positively address that problem and implement that policy solution. Uh, and the original Oireachtas report in the terms of reference, which were drafted by Roisin Shortall and signed off and agreed by the, who was then the new Minister for Health, Simon Harris, they do provide political consensus on the difficulties of the health system. And if you look at those terms of reference, there's, you know, there's a bit of the kitchen sink in there, there's everything's in there, but they really name the ongoing challenges of unequal and poor access to care, the fragmented nature of, nature of care in an Irish context, and in particular, the, the overly hospital dependent system of care that we have here. And while many of you will know, I worked in a technical support role with the Oireachtas Committee and assisted with drafting parts of that committee report. Uh, and I'm by no means suggesting it's a perfect document, but what it does do, and there's lots of it I wouldn't necessarily um, have written myself, but what it does do is it provides a blueprint for the direction that policy needs to make if we are to transform our system into a much, into being able to provide timely access to universal access to integrated care. And what we're seeing with the plans that have emerged since then is this um, emergent nature of the reform process. And that's, in my, from my perspective, a positive thing. So the original was a direction of, of travel and what we're getting increasingly is more of the detail of how that could potentially be delivered. In terms of the processes, I think up to February 2020, before we had COVID, I think it is fair to say that the political, economic and health system processes were being put in place to deliver Sláinte Care. They were, it was slow, but we were seeing the early seeds of momentum to drive that reform. And a particular aspect that I found uh, very energising and was um, involved in in autumn, summer, autumn 2019 and early 2020 was this stakeholder and citizen engagement. So bringing a much more bottom up approach to Sláinte Care's implementation. And then if we think about this sort of program implementation stream, we see progress around that there's a program office to drive the reform, but also increasingly this collaboration between the Department of Health and the HSE on, on implementing particular aspects of Sláinte Care, the Advisory Council chaired by Tom Keane, but also money beginning to follow uh, what was needed. And while there was very little money for Sláinte Care in Budget 2019, there was a bigger budget in the budget for 2020, in particular with a thousand new Sláinte Care staff earmarked in that budget, and then significant money in the budget for this year. And I will come back to that. And then particular progress made in specific areas that I've referred to already. Those of you familiar with my work will know that I'm particularly interested in the politics of policy making, and ultimately, I think it is the politics that makes or breaks the making and implementation, effective implementation of effective policy change. I've always been of the opinion it was going to take two governments uh, to implement or not implement Sláinte Care. The first government was slow to take it up, although Simon Harris did take it on very seriously, but his government colleagues less so. And I think it's fair to say that it's questionable still the extent of the commitment in the second government to break that path to dependencies that we've been on and really deliver Sláinte Care. Actors are key in any policy process. And what you see in this picture here are the actors uh, that are involved and quite and why some have shifted roles and um, sort of a, quite a new selection of faces there and uh, I guess quite absent in diversity um, would be a generous comment to make about them. And another Two minutes, Sarah. 
Okay, thanks, Audrey. Um, to track the seriousness of political support and implementation is to follow the money. And this launch of care original Oroxus report uh, detailed a, a transition fund and that has never been allocated. And as I've said already, there was very little in 2019 budget uh, some more, but still nothing like what was needed to shift to social care in 2020. And yet what we see this year is the biggest ever public budget in the history of the state. And why much of that is COVID related, much of it, 1.5, maybe 1.7 billion of it, much more than ever was envisaged in the transition fund could be considered social care's money. And when you look at this policy timeline, for, for it is really just the past year, the past 15 months, uh, a few things have it interesting to me here. One is the absence of any launch of care documents per se. There's no specific, and obviously that's a system that's been focused on dealing with the COVID responses. And lots of these documents are the government-wide responses. But if you look in the program for government, the HSE winter plan, this year's budget, the current service plan, and the HSE corporate plan recently published, there's much more of Slauncher Care in them than in any previous documentation. And so here we are in April 2021, and I think it's absolutely fair to say that COVID has changed and changes everything. It's changed how we live, how we work, how care is provided, but it's also given both the people and the health system a taste of what it is to provide universalism. And Slauncher Care and Universal Health Care are in the programme for government. There has been more Slauncher Care investment in the last year than ever before. And so the question remains, does COVID-19 provide a window of opportunity for Slauncher Care's whole system reform? Can it assist with implementing Slauncher Care's vision of timely access to universal health care? And Kingdon's literature, he talked about the policy entrepreneurs who are like surfers waiting out in the deep water to big wave to come along. And I suggest that many of the agile responses from clinicians, allied health professional, health system managers, community groups, NGOs, who've used COVID to bring out change are those policy entrepreneurs that they've they were freed up to provide cares in ways they did not think possible weeks before COVID arrived. And that said, will we continue to make the mistakes of the past, of our piecemeal reactive reforms, of firefighting, instead of harnessing COVID-19 as an opportunity to bring about this system-wide change that's so badly needed? And critically, is there political know-how and support and courage to really implement Slauncher Care? And I look forward to discussing these with you in the panel discussion. We look forward to that as well, Sarah. Thank you so much indeed for that wonderful presentation. Well, our next speaker this afternoon is Dr. Nick Klazinga. He is head of the OECD's Healthcare Quality Indicator Program, and he combines this work with a professorship in social medicine at the Academic Medical Center at the University of Amsterdam. He is an advisor to the Dutch healthcare system and the Canadian one, and he also advises the World Health Organization. Nick. Thank you, Audrey, and good afternoon. Thanks for uh, <clears throat> inviting me to share with you some reflections on the, on, on, on the topic from the perspective of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. And what I will try to do in the 15 minutes allotted is build the following story. Of course, if you work from an in, for an international organization and surely one that looks at the overall impacts of changes on society and the economy when when being asked to look at the at the impacts of the pandemic on the healthcare system uh, the focus is on the system as a whole and that means that what i will try to do is briefly share with you some impressions on how to assess the impact of the pandemic on access and quality of healthcare delivery and ultimately what we know about the effects that has on population health. Then I will briefly summarize some of the, 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 the policy interventions that, that are in initiated uh, since March last year to contain the pandemic and also initiatives to mitigate the collateral damage. And I, I know we haven't found the right words yet. The, the World Health Organization speaks about dual track monitoring when they mean you have to monitor the impact of the pandemic 
from an infection control side and alongside you have to monitor the impact on the, the on, on the health system in the discussions in canada um in the past weeks i heard people labeling it as the, the shadow pandemic and the echo pandemic but it's obvious that you list interventions and you try to see how does that reflect on the healthcare system as a whole and what impact does it have on the short-term outcomes and i was happy to see the candidate presenting and a lot of the in interim outcomes you, you you have in in ireland and what does that mean for the long-term outcomes so my presentation is from the perspective of performance management of health systems and actually optimizing the use of information to understand what is uh, happening and using that information to make your the system more resilient again that's also a policy word uh, very popular within the european union at the moment different people have a different meaning for what means resilience but it overall means how can we make our our systems responsive to the external in, in influences that we have to deal with and how can we keep the balance within our system of dealing with the COVID pandemic on the one hand but also performing as good as possible with the, the healthcare delivery of the of the rest so let me start with with the ultimate outcome and i know that's not the focus of today's discussion but i just want to put what ireland is doing in that perspective i don't know how many of you uh, are regularly visiting the website of eurostat but last year the last week or actually on the 7th of april the, the data were produced on the life life expectancy at birth uh, in 2020 and when i looked at those data you basically see that all over Europe, there has been a steep decline in life, in life expectancy at birth. Most heavily uh, affected are countries like Spain and Bulgaria, where it calculates up to 1.6 years decline. Um, more positive is Germany with 0 0.2 and very positive Denmark and Norway that actually had a zero or slight, slight increase in life expectancy. But all countries kind of group in between and, and roughly you see you see a group of countries that are seem to be heavily affected and a group that seem to be medium affected. I tried to find it, the Irish data, they're, they're not there yet, it's one of the few countries who haven't reported the statistics, at least in a way fit to be published by, by Eurostat at the moment, but I think that number will turn out to be quite interesting because when you look at the trends of life expectancy at birth in Ireland, you are one of the countries that over the past years have really geared up. In the past decade, you see a, a steep rise in life expectancy. So it, it will be meaningful to, to know and to know shortly what, what the impacts in of this, the, the numbers of 2020 does with the overall life expectancy in Ireland. That being said, that's just one of the parameters to, to, to look at. And actually, if we want to, to measure the, the impact of mortality, in one of the presentations and the comparison with the NHS was mentioned. The OECD has been in a lot of debates on how do we get meaningful international comparisons on, uh, on, on deaths caused by COVID. Uh, perhaps some of you remember an intervention of the then President of the United States where he presented and on, and with statistics how the US was doing better than Belgium, which caused a kind of crisis with Belgium because basically the underlying statistic didn't reflect the different ways of coding COVID, the different ways of identifying it, putting it in your statistics. So a lot of work has been done over the past years by on the technical side to, to really try to calculate excess mortality, to see the prognosis of mortality over time and try to see what the pandemic and the, ex the period of a pandemic added to the mortality and make these uh, data comparable. Again, that's not what I will be focusing on. I just want to let you know that, that you can't discuss the performance of healthcare delivery uh, on its own. You have to see it in the broader context of the performance of the system. And that also means the two bullet points here. Um, OECD has been asking its member states to, as much as possible, already deliver data on 2020. So we have some first glimpses on, on experience, physical and mental health based on, on household surveys that were held in 2020, but also the, the potential changes on underlying risk factors like smoking, drinking and obesity. 
all this is the kind of background against which you, you, you can access the, the impact on healthcare delivery for what we consider at anything else than patients with, uh, with COVID. Just some of the parts of the puzzle. And again, I decided not to show you loads of statistics because they are still too not condensed enough and it, it, it's difficult to make one coherent story of it. But the glimpses are already there. We see the, 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 the impact of vaccination programs in children and influenza and especially the screening programs. Screening programs, obviously the data of Ireland, of postponement of cancer screening. And then of course, depending on the time you do that, that might cause, uh, cause problems. Countries try to assess the impact on chronic diseases, and that's mainly by looking at the functioning of their primary healthcare system. What happens with persons who have diabetes, COPD, and chronic heart failure? Uh, I was happy to see the figures on COPD because I am aware that the avoidable hospital admission rates for COPD in Ireland are slightly higher than in many of the other OECD countries. And it's interesting now to see a decrease, but the question would be, was that, what does that signal? Does that signal that patients with COPD were now better treated in primary care and hence there was less unplanned admissions to your hospital system? Or was the explanation that people were afraid of going to the hospital, they, they stayed away and it just didn't, a, a lot of complaints didn't result in, in a referral. Many questions are still open, but especially when we look at the data on, for example, diabetes, and you look at the prescription the, the data that are available from countries, the, the, the referrals to hospitals and the unpleasant admission rates. And also in some countries, the decline in, in amputation rates, it is the start of trying to understand what, what, what is happening here. Are we still in control or are we getting a backlog of people who are not referred to the hospital which will come with more severe <coughs> problems later? This is surely the case on cancer care. And I was happy to see the, the data for Ireland. I've also seen some of the reports on the impact of uh, the, the pandemic on cancer care, especially your, your the, 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 the drop in diagnosis, which was, was reported. And I remember the, the drop in prostate cancer diagnosis, but also now is shown the, the impact on surgery. Thing is, of course, that you try to get grip on those numbers and try to make to see what impact it has. I can just confirm that what I said, saw about breast cancer is in accordance with the, the work the OECD is doing with now with, with, with I think 15 countries on, uh, on patient reported outcome measurements. Those are not national representative data, but groups of hospitals that perform breast cancer. What we saw in the data is based that in all the 15 countries, the, the volume of surgery was going down. I also signaled that there was some transition in the type of surgery. So basically when the capacity is, is, is skewed, you get waiting times, you have lower volume, but also in the choices that surgeons are making on what operation to do, it has an impact. On acute care, <clears throat> there again, we can look at the, 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 the emergency admissions, but also the impact on stroke and, uh, and myocardial infarction. First data, show that in some countries they, they see that part seems to be well under control. I was happy to see the data from, from Ireland. I've also seen some initial data from other countries where there was a, a big trend change with the 30-day case fatality rates before. And of course, then it begs the question, is that because question care is better or worse, or is it that parts of the, the cases don't come to the hospital anymore? The chain is, is not functioning opt optimally. Elective surgery, it has an impact on the waiting list. The OECD tries to compare the, 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 the waiting times. Here also the, the, the example of, uh, I put here, hip replacements. We have a project where we work with about 20 countries uh, and, the, and the hip registries on, again, looking at prompts before and after. But one of the things that we learned in the, the meetings in the past months, that in all countries, the number of orthopedic surgery hip replacements has been dramatically reduced. Although some countries it, 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 it's mitigated, it's not that much. Others, I remember the UK, there's some orthopedic surgeons said it was reduced with 50%. I also observed some other innovations there. We see that in, in concurrent with some of the data that were uh, presented earlier, that, that length of stay might change. And in, in Alberta, for example, you see that length of stay for hip replacements has certainly has re reduced, 
that's not because of the pandemic, but that's because, probably because of an, a, a change in, 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 in practice of having people shorter in the hospital and more physiotherapy at home was kind of accelerated because of the pandemic of, and the incentive of having people as short in the hospital as, uh, as possible. On long-term care, the impact is even more difficult to, to grasp. But here again, by looking at the access side, we, we see that in, in some countries, long-term care facilities were not occupied. Basically meaning because people most likely felt afraid, didn't feel safe. So we're postponing a referral to a nursing home or another other setting. So that means apart from these effects, it, it's important to capture the, the, the effect on the population in terms of patient trust, experience safety and patient experiences. And several member states have survey methodologies for bits and pieces of it to, to, to capture the impacts. The other very important part is of course, is there a differentiation in subgroups? Are there inequalities? And are there certain socioeconomic groups or vulnerable groups that are more affected by the pandemic in sense of having <clears throat> less access or perhaps less quality of care than, uh, than others. And this de depends very much on the extent to which your statistical data can actually show this, uh, this impact. Impacts, well, as I said, the other part of the story is the response. I will be quick here, but if I, if I look at the reports and also the report Sarah has been working on with the observatory, I see you had three waves uh, with, with three statewide wide lockdowns, so a severe impact. Uh, up, upscaling of the testing capacity is in line with the EU average. Half of the Irish population is reported to have downloaded the national tracing application. And I, I was impressed by the e-prescribing and, the, and the, the portal that was uh, that the health service executive opened in uh, primary care. What I understand is that your ICU bed capacity nearly doubled thanks to search agreed and the interaction of the public and the private hospitals. A similar movement we've seen in many other countries and your rollout of the vaccination seems to be relatively on, on track with these were data that I found in uh, for, for April uh, 2020, 2021. So yeah, now- Just less than one minute. Yeah, so Thank the you. lessons, what we, what we learned have to do with linkage between public health, primary health care, hospital care, and long-term care. This has to do with repositioning primary care and, inter and integrated care, very much on many of the, the initiatives taken by Sloan to Care. The collaboration of the public and the private sector in terms of a pandemic and creating surge capacity, the importance of a dual track approach, the acceleration of digitalization, fertile consultation, consultation, but also the availability of information. Many information has become real-time available and much quicker because we need it to steer. So to conclude, I would say that that's to manage the system as a whole, strengthening of the national information infrastructure is necessary and health system performance assessment can help you here. Uh, I had the pleasure in my academic role to work with your Department of Health in the past years on a project of working towards a health system performance assessment framework. This is the framework very draft that that was agreed upon. I think if that work would have taken up and linked with all the information pieces that are available, it would help to use it as a frame for the puzzle. And then of course, making that puzzle, I, I really hope that it will help to, to change from an ad hoc reaction to incidents to an informed, overall in, informed progress of the, the strengthening of the healthcare system and seeing how you can optimize the existing capacity in a way that maximizes outcomes. Thank you. Nick, thank you very much indeed. Much food for thought there in that presentation. Well, our final speaker in this session is someone who, along with his colleagues, has guided us through this pandemic since March 2020. A trusted medic, Dr. Ronan Lynn is the country's Deputy Chief Medical Officer and has been acting Chief Medical Officer since February of this year. He qualified as a physiotherapist, a medical doctor, and then completed a lab-based PhD in surgical oncology before transferring to a higher specialist training program in public health medicine in 2014. Ronan. 
Thanks very much, Audrey, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, to present to you all today at this this important uh, time or this important phase in our response, where I think it's important that we begin to take stock and learn lessons from uh, from the year that's been uh, and begin to look forward at, at uh, what might be possible into the future. Uh, I thought just before I got into some key uh, key thoughts, I suppose, on that that people would appreciate just a few minutes of a quick overview of where we are in relation to COVID uh, in the country at the moment. So I might just quickly share a screen if that's okay. So can people see that, uh, that slide set? Yes, we can. Okay. So that's it now. Thanks, Ronan. Yeah, we can see that. Excellent. Just very quickly. Um, so we've seen a, a marked reduction in the number of cases that we're reporting each day and uh, our 14 day incidence as of yesterday, in fact, was down to 132 per 100,000 population, uh, which is the lowest than it's been in, in, in months. Uh, we had 206 patients in hospital this morning and we had uh, that you read 48 in ICU this morning, which is the first time we've had less than 50 patients in critical care since New Year's Day. Um, so we've, we've, we've come through a very tough number of months, but, but things are, are looking much brighter than they have for quite some time. Um, just to say that despite that, we, even last week we reported almost 3,000 new cases. And so with levels of disease like that in the community, it doesn't take much uh, for the trajectory to change and reverse quickly uh, if we were to, uh, uh, to, to undergo an undue amount of easing over a short period of time. Uh, so these are just the hospital figures, as I say, 206 in hospital this morning, uh, but we reached a peak of over 2,000 patients in hospital uh, back at the end of January, and that it really just is a testament to the, to the dedication uh, and, and resilience of staff across our health system that we managed to weather uh, the challenges that were posed at that time. Uh, similarly, we currently, as I said, of 48 in ICU, having reached a peak of 217 patients in critical care, but obviously with many, many more patients uh, receiving advanced respiratory support across, uh, across ward settings through January and February in particular. Um, on, on a good note, uh, it's been really uh, heartening to see the virtual uh, disappearance of cases of COVID-19 across our long-term residential care settings. And last week we reported no new outbreaks in nursing homes. And that was the first time that we reported no new outbreaks in nursing homes since last July. So a really, really welcome development. And that's then mirrored uh, in, in very substantial decreases in mortality uh, from, from uh, the really uh, significant levels that we were unfortunately reporting in January and February through to where we are today. And if you focus there on the gray, the gray box in each of those, again, that's that's nursing home and residential care. And you can see that that has really, uh, really tapered off over the past number of weeks in particular. Uh, the reason for those improvements has obviously been in, in large part uh, in our most vulnerable due to vaccination, but in large part, it has been due to the efforts of our population. And really, we've seen an extraordinary level of compliance with public health measures. And this is, this is the average number of close contacts that each confirmed case reports on a given day. And we can see here that since the end of, end of February, we've effectively been reporting 2.6 average close contacts per person for weeks and weeks and weeks. And that really does show that despite some of what you might see or hear, the vast majority of people across the country are continuing to stick with this, hard and all as it is for them and for their families and communities. Uh, so just uh, the other measure that we look at is obviously growth rate. And over the past week, we think we've decreased by somewhere between zero and 2% per day. Uh, but there is uncertainty at the moment, just given that we came through the Easter period uh, and referrals uh, and other indicators would have been skewed a little bit last week. So we need to see where we are at the end of this week, really to, uh, uh, to be sure that the progress that we appear to have seen over recent weeks is real progress. Uh, so just broad situation analysis. Uh, uh, we've done well, I think, but any, any success we've had has been, has been driven by people's willingness to buy into the measures. Uh, we would expect to see some increase in incidents over the coming weeks with the return of in-person education. Uh, and a key part of, of avoiding any undue increase is that people continue to work at home uh, and don't see a return to schools as, as an opportunity to go back into workplaces, which are a key driver of transmission uh, at the moment. Uh, we will, we, we, we're, we're looking forward to a strong protective effect of vaccination across the population. 
uh, but we won't see the impact of that for, for some weeks to come. And it is worth noting that through the pandemic to date, half of people hospitalized and 70% of admissions to critical care uh, have been aged less than 70 years of age. And obviously the majority of that younger cohort have not, have not even begun to receive vaccination at this point. So in broad terms, the next six weeks remains a critical window, but on the positive, if we can, if we can maintain social contacts in or around where they are at the moment, if we can avoid a fourth uh, surge in cases over that time period, uh, we can look forward to a much better summer and, and could potentially avoid any further significant impact on our hospital system and ICU capacity. Um, so I'll just stop sharing that and maybe just give some uh, thoughts uh, more broadly. So I think, uh, I think most people at this conference would agree the pandemic has already had a very significant impact on healthcare policy and on reform and investment over the past year. And it's shone a light on the deficiencies and challenges within our system, but has also res resulted in many significant and systemic innovations across the system. And I just want to reflect on six of those as part of this uh, discussion. So I think first and foremost, we've been reminded again of the importance of health and of the importance of a healthy population. Uh, at an individual level, we've taken measures throughout the year to protect our own health and that of others. Uh, whilst at a societal level, we've been reminded of the influence that health has on overall economic and social progress. Uh, and again, contrary to much of the commentary that would seek to divide us over the past year, uh, the reality is that public health uh, and the public's health and wider societal and economic well-being are completely intertwined. Uh, we've also witnessed firsthand the role that communities themselves play in supporting community health and well-being, uh, particularly for vulnerable populations. Uh, and that's been a cornerstone of the Healthy Ireland programme since it commenced. But we need to see that uh, play out now over the years to come. We've seen unprecedented cross-society, cross-sectoral, cross-community cooperation uh, with a multitude of initiatives across government. Um, but we've also learned in many ways the hard way, the hard way, unfortunately, the critical importance that we, we must place on a robust, comprehensive and a resourced public health medical service. Uh, and to my mind, the development of the specialty of public health medicine across all four of its domains, uh, health protection, health improvement, health service improvement and health intelligence needs to be a fundamental underpinning to overall health system resilience and transformation in the years ahead. I think another area where we've seen uh, a really th the critical importance is that of infection prevention and control. It was and continues to be a key enabler in the provision of both COVID-19 and non-COVID healthcare services. Uh, prior to the pandemic, there was significant work being done by Martin Cormican and uh, multiple colleagues, both across the department and the HSE, uh, to increase capacity in relation to IPC and antimicrobial stewardship. Uh, and whilst we've undoubtedly made advances in recent years, I think uh, uh, there is an opportunity through increased recognition of the need for health protection, the need for IPC, uh, to build on that uh, in the years to come. Uh, I think in particular, COVID has demonstrated the importance of the physical environment and infrastructure in supporting good IPC. Uh, and this learning must shape and influence capital investment in the years to come. And next, I think the pandemic has shown us that many of the innovations and changes in care that we've aspired to for years are possible and can be delivered. So we've talked about them a lot. We've aspired uh, to achieve them, but for, for a variety of reasons, they weren't achieved, they weren't delivered. And COVID has shown that things can be achieved quickly when people come together. Uh, in a matter of weeks, we saw systems and processes put in place to allow for greater levels of telehealth, virtual consultations and clinics, e-prescribing and other e-health solutions. And the way many services are delivered has been completely transformed, but we must now not allow those improvements to be reversed as we emerge from the current challenges. Fourth, I think we've seen unprecedented, unprecedented levels of investment in healthcare, which will hopefully make a lasting difference to, to, to the overall service. Over a thousand additional permanent beds have been funded under the winter plan or the, the budget for this year, uh, with the majority of those already in place. And there's been a very significant additional critical focus on critical care capacity. And that has been a core focus of NEFIT's consideration since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, as you may be aware, there were 40 additional critical care beds provided in March. Uh, 2020 uh, and it's been built up from there and there's a strategic plan in place to increase capacity to 446 critical care beds in the longer term uh, and hopefully to have 321 beds in, in, in place at the end of the first year of, of the plan to increase that capacity. I'm nearly there. Fifth, I think 
whilst we've known for many years and there are many recommendations and many reports sitting on many shelves on this, uh, the pandemic has brought into very sharp relief the fundamental and absolute importance of good data uh, and good information systems. And we've had pockets of excellent practice in this country, but it is something that our system has struggled with more broadly for years. Uh, the lack of a national individual health identifier, disease registries, national IT systems for immunization programs and for uh, infectious disease outbreak management in the community have all presented very real challenges for us in trying to manage the response to the pandemic. We have seen though for the first time, I think in Irish healthcare, national health identifiers being used within systems such as those used for disease surveillance and test referrals, allowing for data linkage across data sets. And this will hopefully lead the way for real changes in how we capture and use data across the system uh, in the months and years to come. And just to finalize, I suppose, and I think it's the most important point, uh, we now know what's, what's, what's possible when all of us come together across health and social care system uh, to work collectively and collaboratively, collaboratively to tackle shared problems. We've witnessed extraordinary levels of interdisciplinary, intersectoral and interagency cooperation over the last year. And it is my sincere hope that this will leave a lasting legacy and will provide the foundation and the motivation for the system to continue to build on the many advances and innovations of the past year so that we can address the longer term reforms of our health and social care services that are so urgently required. Thanks, Audrey. Ronan, thank you very much. And uh, we know, like all of our panellists, you had a very busy day. Uh, so thank you indeed to you all for your time today and for taking part. Uh, we have around 15 minutes or so for a discussion, so not too much time. And we want to hear from as many of our audience as possible. And indeed, they have been texting in some questions, a lot of uh, gratitude and praise to you all. And, and thank gratitude for your endurance uh, during this pandemic. If I could please ask our panelists to um, not to forget to switch on their microphone and their video um, once they're brought in for a question so we can all see and hear them clearly. Um, Ken, I will begin with you, if you don't mind, and a question really, once we are through this pandemic, and it will happen at some point, Will our health service be able to cope with the, the numbers that are waiting for treatment, waiting for surgery, waiting for our healthcare service to deliver for them? I think if you're referring to scheduled care, the, the answer is it will struggle. It has always struggled. Um, we, we have a policy in this country where we've used the National Treatment Purchase Fund to manage waiting lists. And while I think patients probably like this, um, and it's good from a political point of view because it reduces waiting lists. It's done nothing to drive a sustainable solution to scheduled care. And I, I would hope that this COVID pandemic would at least focus on the fact that we need a sustainable solution. Uh, and the purpose or the way to do that is to separate scheduled care from acute care. And many of us have campaigned for that uh, for many, many years. And I think that's in sharp focus now, and hopefully we'll get traction across the various health agencies as a consequence of this. Sarah, what do you think? Because many people are asking on the, on the text about that and about Sláinte Care. Is this a window of opportunity for Sláinte Care? Uh, I, thanks, Audrey. I think it is. Uh, I think obviously there are significant challenges facing the system, including a workforce that has been working under horrific pressure for over a year, but also a lot of unmet need evident in some of those figures that Ken presented earlier and delayed access to care and treatment. And as delay, as Ken and Nick both pointed out, we haven't ever been good at getting that rapid access to care. But there's no reason that we should abandon those targets set in Sláinte Care to do it. And Ken referred to them as aspirational. And they are aspirational in terms of where we sit now, or indeed even where we sat in 2017 when that document was published. But most other European countries can get that access to care within a reasonable time frame, with non-urgent access to care within a 10, 12 week time frame. There's no reason we can't get there. It will take time. And in order to get there, we need to do lots of things. We need to provide more of that care in 
the public hospital system, but also I think we can learn from some of the innovations, finding new pathways to care, people, treating people who can get care outside of hospital, uh, really learning from those innovations in staunch care. And if we do, or, or that have been part of COVID-19 response, and if we do them simultaneously with that investment that's needed in the system, then I think that is possible. Let me tell our delegates, please submit your questions uh, via the Q&A button on your screens and indicate which of our panellists you would like to answer those questions, please. That would be great. Uh, Nick, can I ask you a question about ICU? Because in, in this country, as you referenced, uh, we almost doubled our ICU capacity in a very short space of time. How do we maintain that? How do we ensure that that ICU system does not revert to the system it was before the pandemic? Um, the short answer is through, through information and governance. So information to, to really know what do you mean with an ICU unit? I've seen in various countries where, where, where government only knew the number of beds but what you actually need, of course, is the combination of a bed, the technology and the people. So you need to have an open, transparent way of getting real-time information on the actual national capacity on ICU, where hospitals can trust each other that if you give the data, that they, 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 they won't be pushed in a certain corner. So I, I think information and, and a good system for that is key. And I've seen different countries setting up different ways of getting that intelligence either via and then a, a registry which was already there for the ICU or via administrative data but you, you need to have that overview it needs to be it needs to be reliable and it needs to be actionable in the sense that you need real re, basically real-time data the other part of course is that you and that you accept the governance and of course that depends very much on on what kind of regulations you have for private hospitals, for public hospitals, but if you see this is a national function, we need to have critical care capacity, and we define it as, as a combination of things, then you accept that there is a sort of kind of national control, which is considered by all the, the, the parties involved as, as fair. I know this is a generic answer, but in, in essence, it's information and, and governance. And what I see in, in some countries, it also has to do with how you optimize the use of your, your clinical capacity. I was involved in, in evaluating the, the, the reaction in Belgium, and I know the situation in the Netherlands. And then it's interesting to see that in similar situation, in the Netherlands, you, you start shifting patients from, not COVID patients, but other urgent patients from one hospital to the other. So you start getting a kind of national distribution to optimize capacity. Well, under the same circumstances in Belgium, it, it, it's only on optimizing the ICU component and not the rest. Just an observation that, yes, some lessons can be learned on how to make it sustainable, but information is key and clear governance agreements uh, are also key. Ronan, what's your view on this question? Because many people who I've spoken to, they say that the two main things for them once this pandemic is over is to ensure that ICU and our IT systems don't revert to what they were pre-pandemic. Well, thank you, Audrey. I mean, the only way we have coped with intensive care was to take recovery rooms from the operating rooms and indeed some of the operating theatres and to use them uh, as temporary intensive care unit beds. And the, the truth is, uh, as we begin to revert back to delivering um, scheduled care, our ICU capacity will, will, will actually revert back to what it had been uh, until there is actually new infrastructure. And we've had reports a decade ago uh, that we needed about 60% more ITU beds than, than we actually have. I think the most important question uh, for the panel and for Slauncher Care in particular is whether there is a political will now to rationalize the smaller hospitals. Uh, we cannot sustain 26 hospitals delivering 24 seven emergency care. We cannot staff them at an internationally uh, uh, sustainable level. Uh, and that brings great inefficiencies. And without that rationalization, I fear we are going to waste a lot of money. 
Sarah, can I ask you for your opinion on that? We've been here so many times before, haven't we, when it comes to the, the smaller hospitals and what to do with them. It's a massive political decision. It is. Uh, and I think it's it's one of many components that needs to happen for social care to be delivered. And I think there is a danger that we continue and overly focus on the mistakes of the past, on focusing on the hospital system, rather than building up the health system as a, whole, as a whole, doing the things that Ronan pointed out of much better public health, much better care in primary and community care settings. And those local or smaller hospitals have a role in that, but it may not be um, an acute hospital 24 seven role, although there is mixed evidence uh, around that. Um, but it is one of the things, but it's not the only thing, an awful lot of implementing major health system reform takes a lot of political courage. And obviously the current government who've only been in place since COVID has been here the, the entire time. So they've been purely focused on, on the COVID response, which obviously is necessary and important, but there is um, a potential pitfall of always focusing on the urgent rather than the longer term important policy aims. And I think we really need to see the leadership in the health system and the politicians looking at that longer term aim and responding to questions like Ronan has raised uh, and not just doing the immediate firefighting on hand. Uh, Ronan Lynn, a question in for you from the Irish Times in relation to the vaccine um, programme. And obviously that's a very topical at the moment. And it's it's so key to our uh, strategy for getting out of this pandemic. And Simon Carswell says Johnson & Johnson uh, has said a short time ago that it is to delay the rollout of its vaccine in Europe as it reviews blood clotting cases in the US. Um, their vaccines account for 15% of projected supplies into Ireland in April, May and June. So again, this question, will this disrupt our rollout program significantly and, and therefore delay the easing of lockdown restrictions in your view? Um, very simply, uh, Simon, it's, it's too early to say. I've been in a meeting since uh, 12.30 uh, at 12.25. This news was announced in the States. I know the EMA is monitoring the situation and as soon as I finish here, I'll be going to discuss with the HPRA. So I can't say more than that at this point, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Sarah, many questions coming in for you in relation to uh, Slauncher Care. Brian Creedon wonders, is staff resilience and burnout an important consideration in the near future for the healthcare catch-up period? There is likely to be a significant number of retirements and uh, reduced working hours among healthcare staff post-COVID-19. Is, is that going to be a major factor, do you believe? I think it is a major factor, uh, absolutely, Audrey, and it's one of the areas that we're looking at uh, in the research project. And maybe just to make clear, I'm not a slaughter representative, I'm researching slaughter care with the system with a view to informing its implementation. But that issue of workforce is key. It has always been key. The original slaughter care report detailed that thousands more staff needed across the system to deliver universal access to timely and high quality care. It's even more of an issue now, given what the workforce has been going through. It's something that the European Commission and WHO have been highlighting for since the first wave and because we've had wave after wave we had the first wave we had the autumn uh, and then the early in the new year I don't think the time or attention has been given that's needed to to think about ways that we can support and mind the workforce that are there but also continue to encourage and make it a place where people maybe come home from abroad to work in Ireland or are willing to to stay here and believe in that that health system in the future, but the workforce is absolutely key to making that happen. Ken, let me bring you back in here at this point, because as we've seen over the last year, uh, new ways of working uh, right across society, not least of which in our healthcare system. So we have seen more and more video consultations being used by medics. Do you think that is something that can be built on? Because I've often heard it said as well that those last few minutes in the doctor's surgery, when patients maybe will tell their doctor that they're not feeling great, that there's something niggling, that those last five minutes in the surgery can perhaps uh, reveal more about a person's health than the previous 20 minutes, and perhaps that they will not do that in a video consultation. What do you think? 
I think that's a good point. Uh, but like everything else in life, I think we need a balance. I think there are many consultations that are quite suitable to be video conferenced. I think there are many um, communications we can have with patients where we don't need face-to-face -face meetings where uh, we can write letters, we can have telephone calls. So I, I think that's something that needs to be worked out. But I, I do believe it is possible to significantly reduce the number of face-to-face -face meetings and congestion that we have in outpatient clinics with a little bit of uh, thought and foresight. Nick, do you agree? Is that one way that perhaps our healthcare systems can uh, develop and make a real impact on the, the, the post-COVID uh, situation with regard to, to waiting lists and treatments and so on? The short answer is yes, but it's good. And I think what Sarah also said, that you try to link the policy development on digitalization, telemedicine, and, and, and innovations there with the redesign of your, your system and with the manpower problem. So these things shouldn't be locked up in, 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 in the old ways of organizing. It also means that, that some workforce, it, I'm thinking about nurses, could, could, could substitute care, do, do, do tasks in hospitals and in home care at the same time. So if you, you see now people have started working together and you see that people have, have started getting used to digitalization, and, and citizens and, and, and patients got to get, get used to that. So if you are rearranging the way how you exchange in information and have a dialogue, you should use at the same time of what, where the hurdles are in, in your present system to have a better use of the of, of, uh, workforce capacity, but also give possibilities to, to, to patients and populations that, that part of them really want to have. It's, it's a balance. So part of it is monitor it closely and know what is happening, but not have it incrementally developed by some pockets that take the initiative, start, try to see. And that's where sometimes international organizations can help, but just giving you examples of what, what other countries are doing and then thinking through whether that would make sense in Ireland, yes or no. I would like to thank you all so much for, for joining us this afternoon, for your expertise, your insights and your, your willingness to answer questions as well. Neek, uh, Dr. Ronan Glynn, Dr. Ronan O'Connell, Dr. Sarah Burke, Ken Mealy, thank you all very much indeed for joining us this afternoon. We are going to take a short break and when we come back we will have four more great speakers for you talking about the future for healthcare here. So see you in 15 minutes. <laughs>